these doors, um, the original uh, doors, were nine foot by three inches thick mahogany doors. Oh, wow. Um, and you see them in all the original historic photos. I mean, they are impressive. And we knew when we were doing this remodel that we had to bring in that aesthetic. And how do we do it? We know that wood dries out, it warps, it's not the right climate for it, which I'm sure they found out, which is why they went to an aluminum storefront door years later. Um, but uh, what we did, this is anodized aluminum. It's regular standard seven foot doors with a transom fixed mm -hmm. partition top, which is how we solve the issue of the wind. Uh, so again, homeowners, if anybody's looking to, you know, they have oversight doors and they end up becoming a sale and taking off with the high winds that we have here. Yeah. So what we did to, you know, preserve the motors and the, the longevity of the doors and the hinges is we had that fixed transom up there to mimic the original door from the street, okay. but then just the regular standard size door opens. So, Clever. Yeah. Uh, so that's the door. And I think that the company that we had do them did a really good job in, in mimicking the original aesthetic. Um, the other item that we found for uh -huh. some photos is the entire building was painted kind of a yellowish color. Uh -huh. And including the windows, there was no accents on oh, the, really? the historic windows uh -huh. in those, those mountains. Uh -huh. So what we did is in looking at some of the older photos, and, and I can send you some photos if you want to pop them up on the video. Okay. But we saw that much like the other historic properties that you walk through, the windows were accented a color. Um, so we, we looked through at what, that, what those colors may have been, uh, and we determined that they likely matched the door. We looked next door at what color the neighbor had, which was a, a dark brown or black color. So we said, okay, let's try to tie it in with the bordering homes. And, and from the pictures that we saw, we knew it was a dark color. So we went a cream color on, on the whole building and then a dark color accent on the, the window mountains to match the door. Uh -huh. And then also the eaves underneath a little element that not many people notice but we painted those oh, too sure. so those used to be white huh. so just kind of make the building pop stand out um, and bring it back to what we envisioned that it, it likely looked looked back in the 1930s thank you so what i'm getting really excited about <laughs> sorry are these lights yes do you know anything about them because these same lights um or a version of them were on City Hall, and they're gone now. Are these original? I'm not sure. Um, if they're not, I believe uh, they were recreated back in the 1991, 1994 oh, okay. remodel. Uh -huh. uh, because we preserved them, we took them down when they were painting everything, and, and then we, we just put them right back up. Okay. Nice. This is stuff though, what is this? That's okay. precast concrete. Oh, and okay. at the time, I've been told that that is the largest precast concrete that was ever made. It was made in Pennsylvania, I believe, is the story I've been told. Huh. Um, and it was the largest precast structure in the early 30s that was made. Really? Um, and it was brought here in, in one piece. Oh. And you could see from uh, the picture of the eagle. Um, that he's facing the olive branch rather than the arrows, so it was constructed during peacetime, not wartime. So that was an interesting uh, factoid I learned about federal buildings is if he's facing, if the eagle's facing the arrows, then the federal building was constructed during wartime, and if he's facing the olive branch, it was constructed during peacetime. So our previous regional director, Terry Fulp's vision was to blend a historic, um, the historic architecture with a modern flair. Mm -hmm. So really modernize the building, but highlight the most historic features of, of our history here. So um, what we try to do is when you walk in, we have these you know big bright white walls, these beautiful circular chandeliers here, uh, a TV, and eventually 
um, pre-COVID, we're still working on these, but there's gonna be a history, interpretive panels on the wall that'll kind of give you the history of the Lower Colorado Basin region, the Department of Interior, this building, um, our ties, in, you know, uh, our mission here in the Lower Basin, delivering water to the West. So um, eventually, you won't hear this echo that we have here. We'll have these nice sound panels up, and when people walk in, you'll be able to kind of see this history. And we have this screen here that, kind of, if we want to roll any footage uh, of, you know. Uh, people speaking or, or detailing our history, people working at Hoover Dam, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you continue to walk through, you can go left or right to these nice symmetrical double doors here. If you go to the right, this is our regional director's office. It houses our regional director, the highest office in our region, uh, as well as the deputy, the two deputy regional directors. Um, and then if you look this way, it opens up to a couple of hotel offices. And then this is our, my favorite room in the building, this is our large conference room. And there's a lot of cool features about this room. So this ceiling is actually the original roof from 1931, constructed in 1931, opened in 1932. So if you remember back in, if you look at photos between 1931 and 1947, the, each wing, the east and west wing, were only one story, and this was the roof. And then in 1947, there was uh, a construction project where they actually built offices above each of the wings to make it that solid second level. Okay. Yeah. So as we were going through um, the design, one of the things we wanted was to open up, you know, the original ceiling joists. We thought that they were really cool. Um, we painted them, put some spray foam um, insulation there to reduce the amount of sound, mm -hmm. right? Because obviously if you're meeting in conference rooms, um, you don't want too much of an echo, especially if you're on a video conference. Mm -hmm. And then what we found is these brick pillars, um, we try to expose them throughout as well. So as we opened walls, if we found cool things, that we're like, wow, that's really neat. It's a shame to hide that behind, you know, a drywall. Mm -hmm. Let's expose it. So uh -huh. that was another feature that, that we did. And, um, and we had them, we had the construction company clean these up and seal them, um, really to show them off and so that they don't degrade over time. How do you incorporate a, a modern HVAC system into a historic building? I'm so glad you asked that question because <laughs> as a mechanical engineer, I'm so excited about HVAC. And, one of the issues that we had is when we tried to incorporate them in the early 90s and they put these big um, you know, refrigeration units in and these air handler units, um, it was very difficult. The ducts, mm -hmm. the duct work was undersized. Mm -hmm. So as you were sitting in the offices, it sounded like you were in a jet engine would just come on um, and it was very disruptive. It was very cold. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did is we totally redesigned, that was one of the biggest aspects of this design was starting over with the HVAC system. <laughs> so this is something else that we wanted to highlight is just kind of a display piece. So again, this area was meant to uh, be able to have the public walk in during certain community events and be able to come in here, read a little bit about the history of our region and, and what we do here in Reclamation on the walls, which we'll have done uh, you know, after COVID and we're able to get back into the swing of that. But um, also come in here, and this was a traveling museum exhibit. So Mark Slaughter, um, he is, was changing this out every six months. Mm, okay. um, so this is uh, now, um, protecting Hoover Dam and the police department. So one of the really unique aspects of Bureau of Reclamation is Hoover Dam Police Department was the only law enforcement agency in the Bureau of Reclamation. So would you like to go upstairs? Sure. All right. So here you'll see the best views, certainly from this floor. So one of the things we did here, and 
like it up here, it's much quieter. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we did here is we tried to design this building for maximum flexibility of space and efficiency of use. So um, although we have a couple of hard walled offices, as you'll see as we go through, um, we have we do have a lot of collaboration rooms mm -hmm. that can later become offices mm -hmm. should we ever need them. Mm -hmm. And we try to open up some walls and have open space. Mm -hmm. So all the lighting throughout the building is LED lighting. That's part of that lead certification. But this lighting will actually adjust. There's daylight sensors in here. Oh, so your um, shades will go up and down as needed? The lights oh, will the light. change. Okay. So you see this sensor right here? Uh -huh. Eventually it'll pick up uh, the ambient light and it'll dim these perimeter lights so that it's saving electricity. Got it. So is this a good place to talk about another thing I've loved about what you guys have done of with course. the windows? Yes, and you did this with your other building. And we'll just take it, like you, you still have your historic windows. Yes. And you preserved them, you didn't change them out, but you did something else in order to make the building energy efficient. Exactly. Yeah, so um, the previous, uh, remodel back in 1994, 91 to 94, uh, it had single pane windows in here, which as many of you know, may, single pane will just transmit the sun's energy, a lot of heat through there. So um, although they had the right intent at the time, don't touch the exterior windows, leave them alone. But you know, the exterior windows, they're historic, they're old, they're drafty. Um, they don't have a lot of thermal resistance in them. So we remove those uh, interior panes and we add really um, efficient double pane windows in here. Uh, and then we went to the um, original window. We replaced any glass that was chipped uh, and we epoxied all of the frames, the original color, this, this dark uh, bronze, antique mm -hmm. bronze, I mm -hmm. believe finish. Um, and we polished up a lot of the mechanisms, um, mm -hmm. especially downstairs, they were made of more brass. These, because they were done in 1947. Again, if you remember 1947, we'd be on the roof right now, mm -hmm. but this was an addition that was put on. So um, these were uh, just silver levers. So we just painted over them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we drilled a little weep hole in there. So as the sun's energy goes through there and pressure builds up, some of the air pressure can escape and it doesn't crack any of the windows. Um, you don't have a condensation issue. No. That's not a problem in this country. Because of a dry climate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is a perfect way to save your windows, but also make your property energy efficient. Exactly, yeah. So if anybody around town is looking to, you know, do a renovation to their house and they want to save a ton on their electric bill. This is a really good way to do but it. But one of the things I've heard though, is that it takes up some space. Like you're now having to, you know, build in to your, you know, space, but it's not that much. It, it does. And you, you run the sacrifice here where you, these are inoperable, so mm -hmm. we can't open them. Um, you can get them to where they're on hinges and you could open them or you, oh. you can crank them and you open them. So there are options if you want to hmm, open okay. them, but. Um, we, we chose this route just because it, it keeps everything clean and then once every few years we'll have a company come in, open them up and, and clean out any oh, dust that okay. the inside. Okay. Yeah. Want to go see the regional director's office now? Sure. <laughs> Does he have like amazing stuff? Or? Uh, not as good as views as up here, believe me. Uh, <laughs> So this is the regional director's office suite. Um, regional director Terry Fold before he retired a couple weeks ago, that was his office. Two deputy regional director's offices are right here. Uh, the administrative assistants, executive assistants sit there. And then this was a really cool thing that we did. And I know it's a little uh, messy yeah, right cool. now, but we opened this up and there's a bit of history about this. So. That again, that's that, that flushing bond mm -hmm. um, that you see in the chimney. Right. 
and that is actually the exterior facade of the building. So if we remove the stucco, that's what you would see. Yep. Uh, so that's the interior side of that because there's a little pop out on this wing here. And then if you look here, this is board formed concrete. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. I mean, you see the grain oh, yeah. from back in the 1930s when it was built. But it's a 16 inch thick concrete wall. It goes from the basement all the way to the top floor. Um, and back in the day, uh, what I've been told, the stories I've been told is this was a vault. So six companies, when they wanted to get paid and they were giving out checks and money and things like that, they came and it was kept in this area, which was a vault at the time. Oh. Yeah, but again, this is another example of we opened up a wall and we saw this and we said, how can we cover that back up? When you get as excited about it as we are, right? Sure. It's like, you have to show this off. Wow. So. I love this painting. That's beautiful. If you came in before the remodel and you, I mentioned that reception area. Mm -hmm. Well, above the reception area was this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was the same color. So this was the color of all the wood uh, mm -hmm. that matched at the time. Mm -hmm. But somebody hand carved this and engraved this. And so we wanted to do something with it. We knew we didn't, obviously didn't want to get rid of it or put it in storage somewhere. It was too beautiful. Mm -hmm. So uh, we said, let's put it in here in front of the regional director's office and, you know, just show it off. So that's just a little, um, you know, historic element that mm -hmm. we were able to bring in, you know, bring in from the old, put it with the new, yeah, yeah. it becomes new again. Yeah. One more cool element is we were always told that there was a time capsule hidden in the walls. And when during demolition, we looked everywhere because we opened up nearly every single wall and we couldn't find a time capsule. So what we did in here, which will be memorialized by this video in case anybody ever forgets 30 years from now, is behind this wall, we have a weatherproof case that's a time capsule. And we have pictures and construction and drawings, oh, nice. and design. And, project team signed nice. it and um, anyway we hit it there as an easter egg for the next <laughs> the next group, you know generations now um. there was a green door and if you look at the pictures the historical photos and i'll, I'll send you some um so if you want to flash them up but these used to be garage doors. So if you look out here, oh. you see that frame around those three windows? Uh -huh. That was a garage door that got filled in by a wall. Oh, sure. So they would back in with trucks and they would unload the coal here. And there were augers oh. that brought them in and, and there was a flap. I, I don't remember if it was on this wall or, or over here, I'm sorry. I have pictures of it and we actually saved that piece of wood. Okay. Um, so it's in, storage somewhere but they would dump it and it would come in here and it would the coal or whatever they used as the medium to burn in the furnace ended up here and then the auger that's why you had that recessed boiler there'd be an auger that pushed it in there oh, and then, okay yep Got it. so again yeah, that's what they use coal that that's what i heard so which makes sense and that the railroad was coming through so it's easy to bring that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. I'll show you. I wanted to show you the bathroom. This is the coolest feature. <laughs> um, and I have a lot of pride in this one because uh, it was going to get covered up and I pushed really hard for this to come out. So this was the boiler um, outlet. So remember I showed you that chimney up above. Um, so this is the chimney and this is where the boiler flew sure. attached. Uh -huh. here and just how beautiful they did it at the time i mean oh my god um and this was just an open hole and when we uncovered it behind the wall it was open and you could just look up and you could look out and see daylight and it wasn't capped or anything wow um so what we did is of course i, I mentioned that we put the ex exhaust air into here mm -hmm. so we needed to fill it with concrete so we filled this whole port up with concrete. We found a mirror, 24 inch diameter, matched perfectly. No way. <laughs> uh, put it up there. How and, lucky is that? <laughs> and we, we brought it out into the design. Um, 
So, you know, it, it's in a wonky place. I got pushed back because it's in a restroom, but really, how could you hide something like this? It's just so beautiful. And, awesome. Yeah. I like the, the contrasting brick, the, which is more, I think, um, what do you call it, brick? That's high temperature mm -hmm. um, yep. brick as opposed to your standard brick. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> nice touch. I know. Yeah. Excellent touch. <laughs> wow. huh. yeah. But but that's another thing. Behind a wall we uncovered. So, you know, I'll stress to anyone working on a historic project, you have, you know, your known knowns, your known unknowns, and your unknown unknowns. <laughs> and this certainly was a project full of unknown unknowns uh -huh. where you run into them and you're like, Oh heck, I wasn't oh. expecting that and what do I do about it? Um, but it's all about having a really good, you know, we're very fortunate. We had a really great team through the prime contractor, the architect, and then the federal team. It certainly wasn't just me. It took a village to do this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. All right. So you mentioned uh, oh my gosh. HVAC That system. is a serious handler. So there's no better place to talk about heating, venting, and air conditioning than the mechanical room. So that's a 8,000 cubic foot per minute air handler unit there. Um, this is one of three. We have three in this building. Okay. Um, so what we did before, there was a fixed opening for outside air back that was installed back in the 90s when this was first installed. And that would bring in about 5 to 10% of outside air constantly, no matter if it was hot, if it was cold, it was just always coming in to bring some fresh air into the building. Mm -hmm. So what we did here is, this is an exhaust fan, um, and then if you go that way, it'll bring in the outside air, which I'll show you when we go to the back, the outside air ducts okay. that we put in. Uh -huh. But all of this duct work here, and through here, and up there, that's all brand new, um, and it was extensive. So right now, this system, can uh, close off all outside air and just recirculate 100% inside air. Um, something that you'll likely want to do, you know, when it's 115 degrees out and you don't want to uh, heat up your your return air that's going through your tiller or your, your condensing coil. Uh -huh. um, but it can also, through this exhaust fan, is it could shoot out 100% of the air and bring that air in from outside. So by exhausting the air, this starts spinning up and it has a little hum to it because it's, again, 8,000 CFS, it moves. But it'll start shooting the air out of the exhaust fan and then it'll bring in this outside air into the coil, into, through the air handler unit. So if you're running it as a fan or in our large conference room, we have a CO2 monitor. So if you have a lot of people in there and it's starting to detect it's getting stuffy, oh. right? It'll bring in more outside air to, um, clear up that stuffiness. That's awesome. Is um, the space at all humidified? You're making humidification? It's not, it's no. Not, okay. Yeah, there's no humidification in the system. Wow. So this used to be a skylight <laughs> for the the basement underneath the floor that we're here that we're on top of right here okay and again we removed that skylight because you have to be creative with any space that you have in a building like this and a historic project where you're confined to how much space you have and we got rid of the skylight skylight we dropped the drop ceiling a little bit and we put the ductwork through and this is where um the exhaust air is wow so the exhaust air up and wow <laughs> how we get air into the building through here. Got it. It's really hard to see, but there's a about eight foot high vent right there on that wall that goes in and turns out and goes into the building. Um, and this is what brings the air in, the cool outside air in, and that then vents it out. So that was part of that air handling unit room that we just saw. Wow. And then we have the same thing on that side. Okay. And then you see 
looked at a big mover that's cut on the wall that wasn't there previously. Okay. We consulted with SHPO to do that. Um, and part of our mitigation of doing that was all of these vents yeah. that are like exhaust vents for restrooms and things. We painted everything the color of the building. Um, and we painted all of the louvers. They used to be a different color. We made sure everything blended in as much yeah. as possible. And as part of the mitigation is those interpretive panels down in Park Street. We said we're going to put interpretive panels in to really draw the community. Yeah. And this is the rear of the building also. I mean, it has the best view, but most people are looking that way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow, nice job. Yeah, that's a great job. Yeah, that's a My name is Blair Davenport, and I'm a member of the Boulder City Historic Preservation Committee. And this is one of a number of videos we're doing um, for Historic Preservation Day that was supposed to happen earlier this year, but because of COVID, we kind of strung it out um, into creating these videos over the month of October and November. And we're here with... Michael Bernardo. And Mike, what do you do? Well, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, um, but currently I'm the river operations manager for the lower Colorado Basin region. Um, so we manage the releases out of Hoover Davis and Parker Dams. Uh, uh, so water delivery, power generation, things like that. Okay. But in my previous life as a mechanical engineer uh, and project manager, uh, I had the distinct privilege to um, work on this project and, and manage this, uh, this building uh, remodel. And so this building is what? What did we just look at today? Sure. So this is the historic administration building. It was built in 1931, finished in 1932 as the original office of the chief engineer for the Bureau of Reclamation and other Re Bureau of Reclamation employees at that time um, during the construction of Hoover Dam. So from this building, um, you know, they could oversee uh, where we see a lake now. It would be the desert. Um, but uh, they could oversee the construction, the railroad bringing parts of the penstock and things down there, um, and also have close proximity if they had to travel down there, so. And um, just to remind folks, the, the building, what, what do you call it, the administrative building? Administration building. The administration building is listed on the National Register of Historic Properties as part of the Boulder City Historic District. Like what kind of, what was the staff like here yeah. that was here? So so originally back in the early 30s, it was the high level Bureau of Reclamation staff that oversaw the dam. Um, currently now today, uh, we house the office of the regional director. So the regional director is our highest position in our region. Um, and then we have the human resources office and, and that staff, as well as the information management and technology office. Um, so talk about the project for renovation um, or I guess can you back up a little bit in sure. that it was built in the 30s but then it was pretty much nothing much happened probably for years until maybe the 90s you said that was the first kind of major renovation yeah so there was um, quite a quite a few iterations of renovations over the years so again construct completed in 1932 um, at that time, it was a two-step, two-level main building with one-level wings. We call them. Uh, then, in 1947, uh, they put additions on the wings to be this building that you see now. That's two levels throughout, as well as a basement. Um, then, uh, future major rehab rehabilitations or, or, or remodels came in the early 90s. So, in 1991. Uh, the entire building was gutted completely um, down to the exterior frame and, and any studs, structural studs and structural members, and then uh, completely rebuilt at that time. So it helped with this remodel because a lot of the asbestos or some of the unforeseen items had already been encountered mm -hmm. during that previous remodel. So. It was remodeled in 1991 to 94. Um, they did major life safety upgrades. Uh, behind you is an emergency exit door. We're on the second floor. Previously, that wasn't a requirement, so God forbid there was a fire. Now the um, employees here had a way to get out of the out of the building. So major life safety upgrades, structural upgrades, things like that were done in the early 90s. 
as well as a complete remodel. Then in uh, early 2000s, 2001 timeframe, there was a major seismic retrofit. Mm -hmm. So the entire perimeter of the building was essentially on all three levels where it was gutted and uh, reinforced members, steel members to the exterior brick structure um, to prevent it from uh, being damaged in the event of a seismic or an earthquake event. Where are those braces? Are they on the interior or the exterior or were they actually embedded? In they're, on the they're on so the interior. So they're above the, the wall lines. They're these big oh. steel members with um, uh, steel bolts. Oh, that's how you did it. I mean, because you've seen the kind where they like span like, yeah. the entire wall and it's just ugly. But, yeah. Oh, no, nice. we were able to do it in a very, um, you know, low impact fashion mm -hmm. to where it didn't really impact the uh, interior or the walls and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this remodel started in 2014 with the architectural design and then actual construction started in uh, March of 2017 and finished in August of 2018. So who were, um, who were the players as far as, did you have designers, architects, mechanical engineers, like who, what, what makes up a team to you know, take on such a monster project like this? <laughs> sure, so it certainly took a village here um, on the federal side. Um, we had a fantastic team of you know, our contracting office, our engineering office, our building facilities office, information technology. So all these folks got together and we had several um, meetings with uh, the design architect who won the, the design bid at the time, Tate Snyder Kimsey or TSK Architects. Um, Where are they out of? They're out of Henderson. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah, they're here locally. Um, so we, we call them design charrettes and we'd get together and we'd go through what is the wants, what is the needs, um, and we you know, took a big extensive list to get everyone's buy-in. Because when you're doing a project like this that has so many people that visit it and so many people actually work here, it's not just up to one person to design the building. It's, it really takes a community, a village, to know what is the best technology to offer, what is the best office furniture layout, what is the best serviceability or maintenance ability of, of your final product. So we all got together with the design architect. We put together a, a project design. Um, and then once that design was, was completed, we went out for bid. Um, the prime contractor that was awarded that bid was Atherton Construction, again, out of, out of Henderson, mm -hmm. here locally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they did a fantastic job and they finished this project in about 18 months. It's and amazing. we weren't <laughs> without our unforeseen uh, unforeseen conditions, that's for sure. So, so um, because this is a, a pretty important historic structure within a historic district, um, was part of your team, hopefully, the State Historic Preservation Office? So, or where did they fit into the equation? Yes, of course. So um, one of our key team members, Mark Slaughter here, he's an um, archaeologist and a historian here with our region. Um, he does all of our, our cultural and, and compliance and state historic preservation consultations and he submit the design plans to the state historic preservation office here in Nevada. Um, also uh, consulted with them and uh, we were found there was very minimal items that would have had any impact because this was primarily an interior renovation. We mm -hmm. weren't touching the exterior mm -hmm. um, but there was a couple things that we did do. Uh, for instance, for the mechanical system, we put an air economizer on all three of the air handler units to bring in outside air in those cooler mornings or afternoons when you don't want to start a 20-ton refrigeration unit. You just bring in that cool air and you save a lot of electricity. So um, we sent those designs, the approximate locations, to the State Historic Preservation Office um, with renderings of what it would look like. And then we got a letter back from them stating, you know, it wouldn't have an adverse impact. And this is um, what they asked us to do for mm -hmm. that, which was paint them the same color of the building so that they didn't stick out and put an interpretive panel down at the street level so that as people came up, they could see what they're, they're looking at mm -hmm. and the significance. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and we did all of those. In fact, we put three interpretive panels, two down at the street level, and one will be at the back patio um, very shortly. So that, that's how we consulted with them. So certainly if this was a brand new construction project and we were building something in this historic view shed, in, in this preservation area, we would have had many more meetings with them. But the fact that we kept the renovation primarily on the interior, mm -hmm. and the sense. interior was completely gutted in the 90s where there weren't really any historical items that they would say needed to be saved, mm -hmm. um, there was, uh, the consultation wasn't as uh, detailed. Mm -hmm. What was maybe the biggest challenge you think? I'm sure there were lots, but was there one that oh. totally sticks out in your mind? Like, oh my gosh, we're never going to get this done. Or... <laughs> um, there was a couple. Um, and it's, it's not just with a historic building, it's not just one challenge. You open a new wall or cut through a floor and you see something else that you hadn't planned for. So uh, the main level, um, one level below the, the main level that you walk in from the park side on, uh, what we found when we demoed all the walls and we pretty much had that whole level open is there was a thin set concrete floor and we were trying to put this very rectified tile uh, down that has very to low tolerance for any deviation mm -hmm. in floor being level. And what we found was the previous remodel, the contractor had put the studs in place for all of the walls and then leveled all of the floors. <laughs> so each floor for their respective, in their respective office was level, but when you removed all of those studs and you had a you know a gap between all of the rooms and you put a level there, mm. each room was off by a quarter of an inch, a half <laughs> of an inch. And that was a nightmare because um, you know you don't want to pour more concrete on top of that because it gets very heavy and also then you have tolerances with then your steps, right? And then your first step going up the stairs isn't the right height. So that was uh, the very first item uh, that we ran into. So how did they reconcile that? We uh, ground the floor down. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. We ground the floor down as much as we could. We found, identified all the, the high spots, uh -huh. ground them down to the low spots, uh -huh. and then took a very thin layer of concrete and poured it over the entire um, floor so that the entire floor was level and we knew that it was level and now if they ever do have to do a renovation in the future when they remove our walls they'll be met with a nice clean floor <laughs> i hope wow so, um yeah so that that was just one of them one. <laughs> yeah the other was the this was a really interesting and, and maybe this could be helpful for any viewers um, that have historic properties our main sewer line we have a six inch sewer line that actually runs through the corridor of our, our basement, um, which we call level 100. It's the lowest level of this building. And it was in areas pitting and, and failing. And we had identified that we wanted to replace all the cast iron um, sewer lines with PVC. And the last item was that six inch main and that was cast iron that was pitting. So. How do we do that? Because it was about 18 inches below ground and it was a six inch concrete and you were digging right through the center of the building. Mm. So what we ended up doing is um, through consult consultation with the architect and the contractor, we found this company called New Flow Coatings, N-U-F-L-O-W. And uh, what they did is they have this uh, they burr out the interior of the cast iron to make it smooth um, and clean it up and then they put like a balloon through it and then they spray an epoxy liner in and they make it essentially a PVC pipe on mm -hmm. the inside. Mm -hmm. So they essentially sleeve a PVC, an epoxy PVC pipe inside cast iron. Yeah. And although you know it, it was pretty costly um, to do, it was probably a fifth of the cost if we were to rip up the entire floor mm -hmm. and not to mention the, the impact it would have to the project timeline. How long will that last, do you know? Uh, it has a hundred year oh, really? lifespan that we were told. So Interesting. Um, it's epoxy, it, it shouldn't fail. Um, I have to go look at the exact warranty on there, oh. but the, the best part is if, if part of it fails, they could just come in and 
Uh, it's not an actual sleeve. It's a, it's a wet epoxy that they apply with yeah. a balloon so they can come and spot oh, uh, treat it yeah. if needed. So. But it does diminish your pipe Interior a little diameter, bit. Yeah. yeah. So the interior diameter of the pipe shrinks a, a little bit, I'd say probably a quarter of an inch. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, you know, an inch thick. It's, it's probably only a quarter of an inch wide. Man, that's, that's super cool. Yeah. Um, what are you most proud of um, as far as this big renovation? Um, you know, I'm most proud of the team that I worked with. It was from the architects to the contractor to the federal team. Everyone was so bought into the project and passionate about it, you know, and there were a lot of times where we, you know, would hit a wall. How do we address this? And we would get together. Um, not any item was insurmountable. We we knew that we can get through anything. We just have to come up with out of the box solutions. And you know, I'm most proud of the team um, that we worked with because, again, 18 months for a project of this size. It's 20,000 square foot building. Um, so to do all three levels with all the you know, unforeseen obstacles that we ran into and being able to do it and how proud everyone was after. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a building that we like to show off. I think, I don't, I don't think, I haven't heard from an employee that has worked in here, you know, a, a negative thing about working here. And that makes me feel good because when we designed this, we didn't want to design it for us. We wanted to design it for them. Mm -hmm to make it a space that they got excited about coming mm -hmm, to work for mm -hmm. each day. So I think that's the thing I'm most proud of. Well, and I think um, that pride showed when, um, I think it was last year during our 2019 Historic Preservation Day, you were one of the folks that was on the tour and you opened it up for the public to come in what was this? and look. And yeah, the reactions I could hear as, you know, walking around was everyone was ooing and eyeing and super, um, impressed by what y'all did so yeah I think the community is very happy with what not only what you have done you know currently but what has been done in the past so um, keep up the good work because <laughs> this um, and actually I want to bring up um, and I don't know if you know this story or know more about it but why is this building here you know as far as the entire planning for the Sure. Um, that DeBoer had and when you know you guys are up on this you know hill yeah. and I don't know if you want to yeah. tell that story but S so super important because of the prominence of this building that it's taken care of so it, exactly um, you know former regional director Terry Folt he wanted to do this um, to leave a legacy for the community to bring it back to its aura that it was back in the 30s and you know back in the 1930s it it was strategically by the baller put on this hill government hill for a purpose it was during the depression and this building with the city being developed around it in 1931 was meant to portray recovery and strength and, and resiliency History is important, and we didn't want to just be another federal building. You know, we call it, you know, federal vanilla or beige <laughs> building, right? This building has a distinct purpose. It was um, exceptional at its time, and we wanted to really restore it to its roots. You did very well. well we certainly um, did it for the community, so... It, it wasn't just for us to show off, but we wanted to, we, we love Boulder City. We're Boulder City's largest employer. We're, we're tied to this community for the long term, and we wanted to make sure that they could be as proud of it as we are. Um, I think that's all I have as far as questions and comments, and thank you so much. It's my pleasure. It's uh, been a wonderful to thank you for the tour um wonderful to meet you all and i think this is going to be a really awesome video so thank you thank you